بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم I ask Allah Ta'ala to grant us all the sincere intention and the good comprehension. Ameen. Yesterday we started explaining the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ And we said that it means Indeed, the religious deeds done willingly by the person would only be considered valid according to the religion if the person had the correct intention. Then the Prophet ﷺ proceeded to say, وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى And this means that the person would only acquire what he intended. So we will explain this, insha'Allah ta'ala. So this means that, for example, if he does not intend qada, a makeup prayer, if one's intention is not a makeup prayer, then it will not count as a qada. Like, for example, um, in the case that he is praying dhuhr, as a qada prayer in the time of dhuhr. Like let's say, for example, it's dhuhr time right now. And the person wants to pray a qada prayer. He wants to make up a dhuhr. And right now, it happens to be the dhuhr time. If he goes and prays, and he wants to make up a dhuhr, it will not be counted as a qada for him. Rather, it will be counted as he's praying the dhuhr of that time. Because he didn't have the proper intention. He has to intend a makeup prayer. So the person would only acquire what he intended. And in this case, he didn't intend qada. He did not have the intention of makeup. So in this second part of the hadith, وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى There is an addition, or if you want an added meaning, which is not included in the first part of the hadith. And it is not the case that the second part of the hadith is, is only there for emphasis. No, that is not the case. Rather, there is an added meaning to what the Prophet said in the first part of the hadith. So it is known from this that if the person uttered a statement that may carry the meaning of divorce, a talaq, and it would also bear another meaning linguistically according to the language, then it would depend on his intention. If he intended divorce, then divorce would take place. And if he intended the other meaning, then it would not count as a divorce. Because one acquires what he intends. And such a person intended the other meaning. He did not intend divorce here. Likewise, if one swears regarding a matter, and the statement that he used has more than one meaning in the language. And one of those meanings is commonly used. For example, one meaning is commonly used amongst the people. And the other one is not commonly used. However, it's valid according to the language. But when he swore, he intended the other meaning which is not commonly used by the people, then his swearing would be according to what he intended. So he would acquire and she would acquire only what they intended. This is the case unless 
such a person was swearing to the judge, to the Muslim judge. Because what counts when swearing in front of the judge is the intention of the judge and not the intention of the person himself. Isn't it the case that at times you have a statement that can bear more than one meaning in the language? Yeah. Now, what some people do, and this is not considered lying, what some people do is they would swear to something, they would swear that such and such happened, or they use particular words that could have more than one meaning. And sometimes one of those meanings is a meaning that would come to the person's mind quickly. Yani, if a person heard you, they might think that you mean that thing. But really, in the language, there's another meaning to what that person said. So he swears, and he has his intention upon the other meaning, which is not commonly used. As long as that meaning is considered as a, a real meaning in the language, yani, that statement can really bear that meaning in the language, then this is valid. And this is not lying. Now, when it comes to swearing in front of the judge, the person cannot do this. The person can't do this. It's not permissible. And this is because what we take into consideration is not this person's intention, rather the intention of the judge. So it's what the judge understands. It's the intention of the judge. And this judgment is as such in the religion so that one does not try to fool the judge. So if the judge made him swear about something, but the person intended a different meaning when he swore, a meaning which is valid linguistically, as we said, different to what the judge intended, then this person did not escape from falling into a sin by swearing on what he intended in his heart, which is in reality a lie in reference to what the judge intended him to swear about. Okay, when we said that the prayer does not count as a qada, unless he intends qada, for example, if one wants to make up a dhuhr prayer during the dhuhr time, and he does it with the intention of praying dhuhr, without having the intention that he is making up a dhuhr prayer, then this would not count as making up a dhuhr prayer, rather it would count as praying the dhuhr of that time, because it's dhuhr time. And this is because he did not intend al qada he did not intend a, a makeup prayer. On the other hand, if the dhuhr time is out, it goes out, and the person wants to pray it, and he says in his heart, I intend to pray the obligatory prayer of dhuhr, then it would be considered as making up the prayer of dhuhr, even without specifying that it is a makeup prayer. The Prophet والسلام, said, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The Prophet والسلام, said, what means, whoever immigrated for the sake of Allah and in obedience to the Messenger of Allah, then his immigration is religiously judged as him immigrating for the sake of Allah. This is all one hadith. So the term here, ilallah, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The term ilallah is used in the religion to glorify that matter at hand, whatever the matter is. 
So when it was used in this hadith, it is to glorify the matter of that immigration. That this immigration is something that has a high status. This hijrah is something that has a high status to Allah. Otherwise, this term, if taken literally, it would mean to Allah. And this is not what is meant. The meaning is whoever immigrated for the sake of Allah and in obedience to the Messenger of Allah, then his immigration is religiously judged as such a person immigrating for the sake of Allah. So the term ilallah in Arabic is used to show the high status of what is being talked about. So what it means here, like we said, is whoever immigrated for the sake of Allah. So again, this term ilallah was used to signify the great status of this hijrah of the Prophet. This hijrah of um, the Prophet and the believers going from Mecca to al Madina in obedience to Allah. And this is like the saying of Allah Ta'ala in Surah Al-Safat, Ayah 99, regarding our master Ibrahim alayhi salam, that he said, Inni dhahibun ila Rabbi. The meaning of this is, I am going to the land which is blessed to Allah, to my Lord. Yani a land that has a high status to Allah. And that is Palestine. But if you take it literally, it would mean, I am going to my Lord. However, this is not what is meant. And likewise, the saying of Allah Ta'ala in Surah Al Imran, verse 55, regarding our master Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, may peace be upon him. Allah said, وَرَافِعُكَ إِلَيْهِ if taken literally, it would mean, I will make you ascend to me, yani to Allah. However, the actual meaning is not that. It means, I will make you ascend to the place which is honorable to me. And that is because Prophet Isa alayhi salam was raised by Allah to the second sky, which is an honorable place to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in the second sky. He's not in any of the seven skies. And he's not above the seven skies in place. And he is not below the seven skies. Allah mawjudun bila makan. Allah exists without a place. So the person who does not understand this well, and there are many people like this, especially nowadays because of how far they are from the religious knowledge. The one who does not understand this due to their ignorance of the religion or ignorance of the Arabic language, they would read something like this and they would many times misunderstand those verses. And they would think that Allah resides in Palestine or that Allah Ta'ala is in the second sky because they take it literally. This is why the person needs to acquire the religious knowledge from a trustworthy person who took it from a trustworthy person all the way back to the companions who took it from Prophet Muhammad. This is how the person guarantees that their knowledge is pure, that it is authentic, and that it is the same knowledge and the same belief that the companions had that Prophet Muhammad had. It is with this knowledge that you will protect yourself. And it is this knowledge that will protect you on the Day of Judgment from Jahannam, from Hellfire. So it is of utmost importance for each one of us to stick to the sessions of knowledge, to stick to the circles of knowledge, the sessions of goodness, and barakat, and blessings. And through this, one would learn everything that they need to learn, inshaAllah ta'ala, so that they can protect themselves and protect their families. 
Otherwise, if the person accepts for himself or herself to be ignorant, if you accept for yourself to be ignorant of the religious matters, then subhanAllah, you would expect from such a person to misunderstand the Qur'an. And that is because ignorance, al-jahl, yu'addi ila al-ma'asi. Ignorance leads the person to disobeying Allah Ta'ala. For some people, ignorance leads them to falling into al-kaba'ir, major sins. And for some people, al-jahl yu'addi ila al-kufr. For some people, ignorance leads them to al-kufr wal-iyadhu billah, to leaving al-Islam. Why? Because they do something, or they say something, or they believe something which takes the person out of al-Islam. So you know there are three types of kufr. هناك ثلاثة أنواع من الكفر. There are three types of kufr. There is الكفر الاعتقادي, the kufr belief. There is الكفر القولي, there is a kufr by sayings. يعني you say a statement which is kufr that takes the person out of al-Islam. والكفر الفعلي يعني a fi'l, a doing that takes the person out of al-Islam. For example, I will give just very short examples, just so we all have a, a basic, at least, a basic clear understanding of this. For example, if a person believes that Allah is in the Kaaba, he is not a Muslim. Even if he prays, if he if he thinks he prays, يعني, he does hayat al salah. If he if he does if he gives the appearance of prayer, he is not a Muslim because he is not worshiping Allah. هذا الشخص لا يعبد الله. He's not really worshiping Allah. He is worshiping something that he imagined because Allah is not in the Kaaba. He's the one that is imagining this. So, you have kufr beliefs, like a person that believes Allah is in the Kaaba, or they believe Allah ala al-arsh, yani physically sitting on the arsh, a'udhu billah. Or they think Allah is in, they believe Allah is in the sky, or they believe Allah is in the second sky, or in Palestine. And there are some people that believe this. Hada kufrun. اعتقادي, يعني this is a kufr belief that takes the person out of al-Islam. وهناك كفر قولي, and you have a kufr which happens by sayings, statements. Like for example, والعياذ بالله تعالى, if a person cussed Allah, شتم الله هذا كفر. والعياذ بالله, شتم الدين هذا كفر. If a person cusses the religion, this is kufr. It takes the person out of al-Islam. And there are many people that do this. So cussing the religion, cussing the prophet, cussing the angels, or anything that Allah Ta'ala gave a high status to, like the Kaaba, like the prayer, like al-Siyam, fasting, Ramadan, anything that Allah gave a high status to, if a person cusses it or belittles it, مَنْ يَسْتَهْزِئُ بِهَا كَفَرْ these things that Allah Ta'ala gave a high status to. So these are examples of a statements that take the person out of al-Islam. And there are more. I am just giving very concise examples. And then you have al-kufr al-fi'li. Then you have doings which take the person out of al-Islam. They are kufr doings. Like what? Like وَلَعِيَذُ بِاللَّهِ تَعَالَى If a person takes al-mushaf and he throws it in, in the garbage. وَلَعِيَذُ بِاللَّهِ تَعَالَى While remembering that this is a mushaf. Or a person takes the mushaf وَلَعِيَذُ بِاللَّهِ تَعَالَى and he steps on it with his feet. هذا كفر فعلي It takes the person out of al-Islam. مَنْ فَعَلَ هَذَا خَرَجَ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ He's not a Muslim. فَمَاذَا عَلَيْهِ يعني what, what does he have to do? عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَتَشَهَّدَ بِنِيَّةِ الدُّخُولِ لِلْإِسْلَامِ He has to 
utter the shahadatain with the intention of entering al-Islam. So he says, أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ In any language. With the intention of entering al-Islam. And he has to know, of course, that what he did was kufr. He has to know that this took him out of al-Islam. So he says the shahadatain with the intention of clearing himself from the kufr and entering al-Islam. So he does not say astaghfirullah. No. He says ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. Then after he re-embraces al-Islam, after he enters al-Islam, if he says astaghfirullah, it would benefit him. Before that, it will not benefit him. Because Allah Ta'ala told us in the Quran that Allah Ta'ala does not forgive the person who commits uh, al-kufr and al-shirk. The one who leaves al-Islam, the one who is not a Muslim, Allah does not forgive him. Forgiveness is only for the Muslim. So he needs to enter al-Islam, then he can say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Rabbi ghfirli, and then this will benefit him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us firm upon the correct aqidah, and we ask Allah Ta'ala to grant us the good end. Allahumma ameen. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ This means, whoever immigrated in obedience to Allah and His Messenger, then his immigration counts as an immigration in obedience to Allah and in obedience to His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So if you notice the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he repeated the name of Allah again in this hadith. And that is because the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, he loves to mention Allah. So he said, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ He repeated it. And this is because he loves to mention Allah. And that's because the one who really loves someone or something, he mentions that one or that thing again and again. Sheikh Samir, may Allah Ta'ala raise his rank, he mentioned before, like a line of poetry. He said that the poet says, أَعِدْ ذِكْرَ نَعْمَانَ لَنَا إِنَّ ذِكْرَهُ هُوَ الْمِسْكُ مَا كَرَّرْتَهُ يَتَضَوَّعُ This poet, he said this line of poetry, and it means, repeat the name of Na'man. Na'man is a place. So he said, repeat the name of Na'man to us, for surely mentioning it is al-misk, yani a beautiful fragrance, you know, like musk. He said, it is al-misk. The more you mention it, the more fragrant it becomes and it spreads. And he said this, the poet said this, because it was a place where his beloved people were, where those that he loved were. So this is how it is. If a person loves someone or he loves something, he likes to repeat their name. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he loves Allah very much. So he repeated his name for this reason and for the reason of barakah, yani blessing. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه. And whoever immigrated for the purpose of the dunya, يعني seeking something from the dunya, or the Prophet said, or for a woman to marry, then his immigration is for whatever he immigrated for. The word dunya is taken from the word adna, 
which means low. Because this dunya has no status to Allah Ta'ala. So if one immigrated for a worldly matter or to marry a woman and not out of obedience to the Prophet, not out of obedience to Allah, then his hijrah, his immigration, is for what he immigrated for. This means that his hijrah will not be accepted by Allah. Rather, it is for what he really intended it for. So he would not get any reward from Allah. He would not get the reward that Allah Ta'ala prepared for those who immigrate for his sake. And notice here that the Prophet said, فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ He said, then his immigration is for whatever he immigrated for. And he did not repeat the term dunya or the terms a woman to marry. He didn't repeat them again. And that is because these actions do not have a high status to Allah. Meaning that this hijrah, this immigration, it has a high status and it should be done out of obedience to Allah and obedience to the Messenger of Allah and not because the person um, is going just to, to seek marriage or for some other worldly matter. No. Such a hijrah is not the hijrah that has the high status to Allah. So one would not get the reward of immigration for the sake of Allah. Many scholars said that the Prophet والسلام, he mentioned this hadith because of a specific incident that took place. And it is that a man immigrated from Mecca to al Madina to marry a woman who was known by Umm Qais. And this matter became evident and known about him. And this is true. So he was referred to as the immigrant to Umm Qais. And this hadith about the muhajir of, of Umm Qais, the immigrant of Umm Qais or to Umm Qais, is sahih. This hadith is sahih. Yani it's a true narration. However, what is not confirmed is that the Prophet said this hadith, which we are explaining now, because of that incident of the immigrant to Umm Qais. This is what Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar said. He said, I do not find a relation between this hadith from all its routes and the hadith of the Prophet to show that the Prophet said it because of the incident of the immigrant of Umm Qais or to Umm Qais. So what we have explained is the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Furthermore, if someone did an act of obedience, seeking the praise of the people, he did it so that the people would praise him and say good things about him, such a person falls into a grave sin. They would fall into the sin of insincerity, riyat, which is an enormous sin. And we seek refuge with Allah from it. Allahumma amin. It is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that on the day of judgment during the time of questioning when the people are being questioned about their deeds three men would be brought forward and questioned. One of them would be asked one of them will be asked what did you do? And he will say, I recited the Qur'an and I taught its recitation to others day and night out of obedience to you, Ya Allah, and seeking the reward from you, O Allah. So it will be said to this person, you have lied. Rather, you did it so that it would be said about you, he is a qari, fulan is a qari. Yani he's a teacher of the Qur'an. 
and it was said. Meaning, you got that which you were after. You wanted the people to say that, and it was said. They did say that about you. Then it will be ordered for him to be thrown into hellfire. Then another man will be asked, and remember this will happen because the Prophet informed us. He said this will happen to these three men. And Allah alam how many people are like them in that, that do those things for the same reasons and they will end up exactly where these people end up. Then another man will be asked, what did you do? He will say, oh Allah, you gave me a lot of wealth, a lot of money. So I spent it on my needy relatives and the poor Muslims and I spent it for, for your sake. Yani, and I spent it in other things for your sake. It will be said to him, you have lied. Rather, you spent it so that people would say about you, he is generous. And they did. Yani, you got what you were after. People thought that you were a generous person. Then it will be ordered that he is thrown into hellfire. Then it will be said to a third man, What did you do? So he says, Ya Rabbi, O my Lord, I went out for jihad, fighting for your sake. And I fought until I was killed without me running away. And I did that seeking paradise in the hereafter. It will be said to him, you have lied. Rather, you did that so that it can be said about you, he is courageous, he is brave. And they did. That's what you were after, and you got what you were after. People thought you were a courageous person, you were a brave, strong person. Then it will be ordered that he is thrown into hellfire. So the person needs to really pay attention to their intention. Especially since the heart of the person fluctuates, it changes rapidly. One would start their deed with a sincere intention. They would start it, لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى Then the intention of the person changes very, very quickly, in a moment. Yani, it happens so fast that the person's heart changes from being sincere to insincere. He would have the correct intention in the beginning of the deed, and then it would change. And he seeks for the people to think of him highly, or to think well of him. And this would lead such a person to their destruction because they fall into an enormous sin. And many times this sin, insincerity, it would seep into the person's heart without the person even realizing. That's how tricky, it might be said, insincerity is. One moment, the person is sincere, and right away he falls into insincerity. This is why it's good to Continuously correct your intention. Renew your intention. One needs to constantly be alert and constantly protect their heart from insincerity. One of our teachers said that this is a matter that many, 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 many people do not pay attention to. And then he said, and if I want, I can keep saying many, 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 many. From how many people do not pay attention to this? Subhanallah. And because of this insincerity, one would do the deed of righteousness and they would not get any reward for it. And instead, they get a major sin written against them. They become a major sinner. One of the scholars said, Watch yourself and pay attention to your heart. This deed that you are doing, 
If the people did not know about it, would you still do it? If you find in your heart that you would have done it, even if they didn't know about it, then go through with it and make make your intention sincere for the sake of Allah. And if you find in yourself that you would not do the deed, if those people weren't looking at you, or if those people didn't know about it, or if those people are not going to find out about it, then be alert. Because truly, that shows that you are doing it for the sake of the people, and not for the sake of Allah the Exalted. And that is insincerity. And leaving out doing a matter is also as such. Yani, if one leaves it out for the sake of the people, then this is not sincerity. Rather, sincerity is for one to leave out the bad thing or whatever it is, the the matter that is not praised, sincerity is for one to leave that matter out, whether or not the people know about it. You leave it out for the sake of Allah. And this is how the believer should be. He knows that all of the different matters, everything, is by the will of Allah. Everything happens by the will of Allah. So if he was granted the acceptance of Allah, then what does he need with the acceptance of the people? Why does he need the acceptance of the people? He doesn't. If Allah accepts you, the creator of everything, the one who gives you sustenance, ar-rizq, the one who protects you from harm, The one whom you will only enter paradise if he willed for you to enter it. If he accepts you, you don't need to be accepted by the people. Allah knows your situation. Allah knows what you are doing and what you are not doing. He knows. And that is enough. But if the people accepted you and loved you and you were not accepted by Allah, then what benefit did you get from that? If the people love you and speak highly of you and think highly of you and spread nice statements about you and when they see you, their heart widens but really you are someone that is a major sinner you disobey Allah and you're not accepted by Allah then what What did the acceptance of the people get you? Each one of us, myself first and foremost, we need to think and always have this matter at the forefront of our mind. That we are going to be buried very soon. Very soon. Much sooner than one thinks, subhanAllah. Many times the person would think that they are not going to die anytime so soon, yani. And then you would find that they die right away. So the person needs to prepare for the grave and be sure that they don't come on the Day of Judgment with deeds that they did insincerely. Otherwise, the person would come on the Day of Judgment and and realize that he wasted his time and his effort seeking the acceptance of the creations of Allah who cannot, they cannot benefit one or harm one without the will of Allah. Allah is the one whom everything happens by his will. So the wise person, he will do what Allah accepts and he will refrain from what Allah does not accept. I ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us and to protect our hearts. Allahumma ameen. If the person rejects the idea of being insincere, then one would not be sinful. 
rather they would get reward. So, if you're trying to be sincere in a good deed that you are doing, and then a whisper from the devil comes to you, like, look, look at these people, they're watching you, they're happy. They're really benefiting from your words. You need to go against that whisper of the devil and correct your intention. Make sure you have the intention lillahi ta'ala. And if you go against that and, and you reject bad ideas, insincere whispers like that, you would get reward. Whispers about, yani, that may lead a person to falling into insincerity. The person would be rewarded if he rejects them. And if he does, if he rejects them, this confirms that he is doing that thing for the sake of Allah. Now, if the person believes that he is doing something insincerely, then he is obligated to repent. He stops committing that sin, and he has the firm intention to never commit that sin again. And he feels the remorse, of course, in his heart for having disobeyed Allah. Subhanallah, the people of purity, the pure people, the awliya, they accuse themselves. So one of them would do the deed of righteousness for the sake of Allah. And due to how much they accuse themselves, they look at themselves with the accusatory eye. With the eye that accuses, not with the eye that praises oneself. No. They accuse themselves, and this is why they're so successful. They accuse themselves. So they would say, I did not do this for the sake of Allah. I did it insincerely. And then the person would repent. This pious person, they would repent. And this is truly what he thinks. Yeah, and he really thinks that he fell into a sin. But in reality, he didn't. He really did that for the sake of Allah. But because of how much they accuse themselves, they think that they fell into sins. So he would repent when in reality he didn't fall in the sin. And this does not affect him. Rather, this would, yani, it doesn't affect him in a bad way. Rather, this would increase his status to Allah Ta'ala. Because this pushes him to strive harder for the hereafter and purify his heart more, purify his intention more, and perfect his deeds. Now, I will mention a beneficial matter as well. If the teacher takes a wage for teaching in a school of AICP, for example. They teach the religion, for example, or something else. Or they work in our schools and they get a wage for that. Does the person get reward? This was a question that was posed. The answer is, you look at that which moves him to do it. What is the thing that is making him work there? What is the thing that is making him teach or whatever it is that his um, task may include? What is the thing that is making him do it? What moves him to do it? Is it the money, the wage, which he will earn or is it the reward from Allah? Honestly. If what pushes the person to do the work, that is, the incentive, is the reward from Allah, then they would get reward if they have the sincere intention. If it is the money that they get, if this is really the thing that is driving them to do it, if it is the money, then they will not get reward for it. If his incentive is to get the reward from Allah, then this means that if he is able, he would do it whether or not he gets paid. It won't matter to him if he gets paid or not. And in this situation, he would be rewarded. If it doesn't matter to him, 
if even if he doesn't get paid, he would still do that thing, he would be rewarded. If he wouldn't do it, if there is no money, then he would not get reward, as this makes it clear that his drive is the money. Similarly, if a, if a person goes to Al-Hajj while bringing along some things with them so that they can sell over there, for example, yani they, br- they bring some things for trade, then they need to check. Why, it, why are they going? Is it for trade? Or is it for doing the act of worship, which is hajj? If the incentive, the drive, that that reason that the person is going is to do the act of worship, then one would get reward for that. And if trade is the incentive, then there is no reward. There is no reward. And with fulfilling the obligation of Hajj being his incentive, yani if this is his incentive, he wants to trade while he's there. But his incentive is Hajj. The thing that is driving him to go is not the trade. It is the fulfillment of the obligation of Hajj. So in other words, if the trade did not exist, he will still go. So his incentive was not the trade. But if it's the case that if now he can't trade over there, so he's not even going to go for hedge, then it's clear that his incentive was the trade. It wasn't hedge. So he wouldn't get reward. You cannot have both intentions like that in the way that we explained. You cannot. The intention has to be solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... Subhanallah, all of this, all of this signifies, denotes that we need to look in the matter of our intention and monitor it. And this monitoring, it, it gets, we get better at it as time goes on. The more that we do it, we get better at it. And we, we can pinpoint, you know, what we need to fix. That is, for the person who does this sincerely, seeking the acceptance of Allah, and they are honest with themselves. One person asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying, الرجل يقاتل يريد ما عند الله وعرضا من الدنيا قال عليه الصلاة والسلام لا أجر له أعاد السؤال للتأكيد فقال عليه الصلاة والسلام لا أجر له أعاده للتأكيد يعني للثالثة قال عليه الصلاة والسلام لا أجر له إن الله لا يقبل من العمل إلا ما كان خالصا لوجهه So a man came to the Prophet and he said A man fights for the sake of Allah and at the same time he seeks some of the worldly matters from the spoils, the spoils of war. So the Prophet said, he does not get any reward. Imagine that. SubhanAllah, imagine that a person, he goes out fighting, he puts his life on the line. In a moment, someone, you know, can kill him. He could be killed in a moment. His head might just go flying. Doesn't such a person need to really look at his intention and make sure that he's doing this lillahi ta'ala? He's putting himself on the line his whole life. What deed does he want to die upon? Subhanallah. So this man came to the Prophet and he wants to fight for the sake of Allah. But at the same time, he also has the intention of taking something from the spoils of war. So the Prophet said, he does not get any reward. So he went back to the people and he told them what the Prophet said. So they said to him, go back and tell the Prophet, perhaps you misunderstood something. So he went back and he told the Prophet, he asked the Prophet, 
And the Prophet said he does not get any reward. And then he asked the Prophet a third time to make sure that he's understanding this case properly. And the Prophet said he does not get any reward. Then the Prophet proceeded to say, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَقْبَلُ مِنَ الْعَمَلِ إِلَّا مَا كَانَ خَالِصًا لِوَجْهِهِ Which means, certainly, Allah does not accept the deed except if it was done completely, only for His sake. We need to make sure that whatever we do from the good is done only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed, those are the only deeds that we will be rewarded for on the Day of Judgment. Those that were done completely for the sake of Allah. So if this is the case, and it is the case, then how can we go on not paying attention to the matter of the intention? How? Subhanallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We will end here, insha'Allah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. 